Good morning, my name's Steve, I'm the vicar here at St Lawrence's Church. Our theme tying into our return to the physical church building this Sunday for worship is celebration and mourning. We celebrate our return to the church building for worship, but we mourn the challenges and discomfort and loss that we've experienced over more than four months now. We celebrate a sense of moving in the right direction. But as some of us gather in the church building, it's all too obvious that things are not as we once knew them. Likewise, for those worshipping via Zoom, as some people gather in the church building, familiar faces, you're all the more reminded that you are not. We all know that Zoom isn't perfect, but it's been an absolute gift to us as a church. But nonetheless, I wouldn't be surprised if some, for some of you, as you worship this morning via Zoom, there isn't a fresh twinge of discomfort at the strange times we are living in. Celebration and mourning, all in one experience, and isn't that the reality of the journey of life and indeed faith? Mixed emotions, not one or the other, not either or, but both and. Today I want us to look together at our two Bible readings and be reassured and encouraged that if we experience mixed emotions as we walk with Jesus, that far from somehow being that indicating a deficiency in our spiritual walk, actually it's the norm. And far from being a sign that somehow we're in error or distant from God, actually the truth is that Jesus is with us and at work in us. So let me start with a question. If you asked me how I was doing, and I said I was limping along, what would your reaction be? If I said that I was spiritually limping, how would you react? Our, re our first reading for today is Genesis 32 verses 22 to 31. And it's a passage where mixed emotions and limping all come together. So why don't you press pause for a moment on this recording and get your Bible out and read through that passage. Genesis 32 verses 22 to 31. As you just read, Jacob has a powerful life-changing encounter with God. Wow, what an encounter it is and what a story to tell that you have seen the face of God and received his blessing. And yet in the midst of all of that story and everything that captures us, everything that we celebrate, and maybe in some ways are jealous of, Jacob comes out of it limping. Jacob wouldn't change that night for anything. But in the morning, he's tender, he feels it, he's limping. I want to encourage you that if you feel like you're limping, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Often for myself, my own experience when God has been at work in my life, is that I felt tender. Sometimes it hasn't always been an entirely comfortable experience. I would say that quite often when I feel like I'm spiritually growing, I also feel growth pains. When God has been doing a work of healing in me, then I've had tender moments. I felt vulnerable or felt a little bruised like Jacob did. I'd also say that part of my own journey of faith has been wrestling with God. Often breakthroughs into blessing have felt like wrestles, wrestling with what God is doing, wrestling with trusting him. But here's what the Bible reminds us. Faith-wise, life-wise, it may feel like hard work, but the blessing always outweighs the wrestling and the discomfort in the end. Whether that end is with the benefit of hindsight in maybe three months when you're further down the line, or whether that hindsight only comes in the context of eternity. If you feel a bit tender, if you feel like you're limping, if you feel a bit bruised, remember like Jacob, that won't be forever. Our Bible reading tells us that Jacob limped out of this encounter, but there is nothing that implies it was forever. Just that for a little while, there was mixed emotions for Jacob. He felt the discomfort, but he cherished the encounter and blessing, and his life would never be the same again. If you're wrestling, if you're limping, if you feel bruised by God, know that the blessing will come, 
and that the bruising, the limping is only temporary. Maybe it'd be worth just for a moment you pressing pause on this sermon so you can pray and talk to Jesus about whatever has come to mind, bubbled up into your heart as I've spoken about wrestling and limping. Now let's turn our attention to a second powerful encounter of blessing and grace as we read our second reading for today. Our second reading is Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 to 21. And again I encourage you, why don't you just pause for a moment this recording and get your Bible out and just read that passage through. Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 to 21. So imagine you're one of Jesus' disciples. You're frazzled, you want to break, and the crowds just keep coming. Don't get me wrong, it's not that it hasn't been an exhilarating day. You see miracles, healing, sovereign acts of God's grace. Your face aches from smiling, your jaw aches from talking. You've been the centre of everything. You've been at Jesus' side as he's ministered. You've witnessed firsthand how he exercises authority over sickness and disease and affliction. As a disciple of Jesus, you're somebody. You're one of Jesus' disciples. Everywhere you turn, people want to know you. They want to talk to you, ask you things. But now, to be honest, you just want a bit of space and time to yourself. It's time to switch off. You wouldn't change anything about today, but now you're tired, you're peopled out. You're celebrating, but you need a break. And as you celebrate all the blessings of the day, you're mourning too. You're mourning with Jesus. It hasn't been a great couple of days. You came here to find some headspace for Jesus, because Jesus is grieving. He's grieving because he's just heard the terrible news that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been executed. No one should have to hear their cousin's head was grotesquely served up on a platter as some kind of sick, vindictive entertainment to the party. You came here for solitude, solitude to give Jesus some space, and yet the crowds just found you. You wonder how Jesus keeps going, how he keeps it together, keeps giving when you know that in his heart he's mourning. He's a better man than you, but then you've known that for a long time now. Still, the day is drawing in. Surely people will be heading off home soon. If nothing else, their stomachs must be aching. And so as we read in our reading, The disciples suggest to Jesus that he tells the crowds to go home. He owes them nothing, far from it. He's given them more than they should rightly ask of him. But as we hear in our reading, Jesus' response is not what the disciples are expecting. As we read, Jesus asks the disciples to feed the crowds rather than asking them to move on as the disciples suggested. If you were the disciples, how would you have responded to Jesus' request? Wearily, irritably, grumpily? How are you when your people doubt, when you're tired and hungry? Myself, I'm not great. I think if I'd been in the disciples' shoes, I don't think I would have been full of grace and faith and enthusiasm. I'd like to think that I, there would be some compassion for the crowds, but honestly, probably, I'd feel like they'd already had their peace of me that day. The disciples, as they ministered, were mixed. Their first reaction had been to send the crowds away. But they are willing to countenance the seemingly impossible idea of somehow coming up with a plan to feed the crowds. And what of Jesus? What of the context of his ministry? Well, as we've read, he was moved with compassion for the crowd. But let's not also deny what the Bible reading also tells us, that he was mourning and seeking some time away to himself. His heart was torn between compassion and personally needing some time to himself. Forgive me, on this occasion, I'm going to take Jesus' miraculous provision for granted. Not that in any way I'm suggesting it should be, but we all know that this miraculous act 
is a further demonstration of the power of Jesus, a further confirmation that he is the Son of God. The feeding of the thousands of people with nothing is a miracle, plain and simple. But here's my question for us. How do you think about what it is to be in the miraculous purposes of God? Do you see a bar, a standard that somehow for God to be effective in your life, you need to be in that spiritual sweet spot of being absolutely focused, absolutely on it, totally undistracted or undivided, or somehow his kingdom purposes can't be revealed in you. Let me reassure you, brothers and sisters, there is more grace for us than that. That bar, that limit, is of our making, not God's. As we've been reminded by our Bible reading today, Jesus knows what it is to be conflicted, to be tired, to be emotionally drained, to be hurting and heartbroken. In his humanity, as he saw that the crowds had followed him, He must have said to his heavenly father, help, give me a break. But Jesus trusts in the goodness of his relationship with his father. He trusts that God's grace is sufficient. He chooses to trust in the father's purposes rather than setting his face to resent the crowd. Rather than resenting them, he has compassion and a desire to bless them. In essence, Jesus trusts rather than fears. He doesn't get into a flap about their oppressive expectations and needs. He places his faith in the timings and purposes of his heavenly father. And as he does this, he lives out the prayer he pours out to his heavenly father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. What a glorious, miraculous outbreak of grace and love is released as he heals the sick and then feeds the hungry. But what of the disciples? Well, I may have done them a disservice and one day when I meet them in eternity, they might say, Oi, do you remember that sermon? You totally misrepresented us. But as I've already said, I don't think that when Jesus asked them to feed the crowds, that they met this with excitement and enthusiasm. They asked Jesus to move them on. But, and it's an important but, they did meet this request with faith. Not with dynamic, punching in the air, whooping with delight faith. But they didn't say no. They didn't go on strike. They didn't say, come on Jesus, send them home. Were they tired? Yes. Were they hungry? Yes. As a consequence, do I think they were a bit frazzled and slightly grumpily? I think that's more than possible. But they did have the faith to say yes. Or maybe more honestly and more accurately, they had the faith to not say no to Jesus' request. They may not have had the type of faith to in any way see what Jesus could do in that moment. But they had the faith to think that if Jesus asked something of them, however tired and drained they were, it was worth trying. As we've explored today, Jesus knows what it is to be human. He gets that we're conflicted. He gets that we get tired and discouraged, that we bruise and our hearts ache. He gets that with a good night's sleep, we're a different person. He gets that sometimes things feel too much. But as he does with his disciples... He involves us, not excludes us. He offers us grace. Here's the kingdom principle. The kingdom is about grace. The kingdom is an exclusive club designed to keep you out. It's not like the SAS where only the elite get through. The only person who excludes you is you, not Jesus. The incredible grace of the kingdom is that Jesus meets us where we're at and works with us where we are. Can you imagine how the disciples felt as they saw thousands fed as they, and as they gathered up the leftovers? Again, I can only speculate, but if I put myself in their shoes, I would have been bouncing. I would have forgotten completely that I was tired and irritable and hungry. 
What an act of grace to be co-workers in a miraculous, powerful explosion of God's kingdom grace and compassion as the crowds were fed. Jesus reminds his disciples and he reminds us that his kingdom is marked by grace and compassion. But that's not just for the crowds who are outside it. It's for those in it too. The Gospels are full of the accounts of reasons why the disciples should be counted out of being the earthen vessels by which God's kingdom is poured out. But Jesus doesn't strike them out. He offers them grace over and over again. So again, as I conclude, I encourage you to pause for a moment of prayer. Here's my question. Where do you count yourself out of God's miraculous purposes? Where do you set a bar that he isn't? Maybe you need to say a prayer where you just acknowledge afresh the incredible, amazing grace that you've received from Jesus. So whether you're wrestling or limping, whether you feel absolutely spiritually primed for action, or whether your yes is not allowing yourself to say no, God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. And if you've invited Jesus into your life, his grace is sufficient. You are worthy of his blessing. And through you, his life-changing, miraculous provision and power can be made available to others through you. You are his kingdom people. Amen.